This conference will now be recorded. Okay. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to a fresh new session on credit risk modeling using SaaS. And uh, in the last session, we were talking about uh, the data quality checks, right? So we started talking, we had completed our discussion on scope analysis and gap identification. And from there, what we had talked about was, we started talking about was data extraction and the data quality checks, right? And uh, we, we had also been talking about uh, the key types of variables which are required. And we had been talking about the key types of uh, variable that should be extracted for different uh, purposes and so on. So for application scorecard, what should be the type of variables? Uh, for behavior scorecard, what should be the type of variables? And so on, right? So in today's discussion, we will be focusing in greater details on data extraction and the data quality check. So the first stage of in model development, or first stage in a scorecard development is the scope or your gap analysis, scope analysis and gap identification. And the second exercise that we have over here is the data extraction and data quality check. So once you have justified to your business that a scorecard needs to get developed, the next thing that, that you talk about is how is it that this model should, so how is it that you should proceed with it? So after you have, once you have got the approval of developing the scorecard, once you justified it from all your various analyses, the next thing that you need to show is that uh, so the next thing that you start off with is you start extracting data right so what we need to understand is that how is this data extraction exercises done right so over here uh, before we talk about data extraction exercises so one very important part of this exercise or one very important part of this is your a very important concept over here would be your data warehouse data warehouse right so in your data warehouse you have the information on all variables stored in different files so your data warehouse will contain initially your source files so the source files are those files from which the information can be extracted so what we have over here is the source files Right. Now, from these source files, your variables, your raw variables are extracted. From these source files, the respective raw variables are extracted. Right. So your raw variables are extracted. Now, what does the what what are these raw variables? So the raw variables are those variables which are mentioned. So your raw variables are maintained in a, in some specific, uh, you know, in some specific format in some specific way, right? <clears throat> now, these raw variables generally what happens is that uh, mostly for big banks, right? So your raw variables are extracted by or is extracted by your data expert teams or data engineers as you may call them or whatever so these are the software btech guys who are sitting there extracting the data preparing the data and creating a sas interface for the same and they are pulling it in the sas format and they are storing they are archiving the data across different folders in the sas format for the modelers to be used right so you have your 
data management team. I'll call it the data management. The data management team. Now the data management team takes this out and puts it in the SAS format. And they generally convert this and they do all data structural. They, they take care of all structural inequalities or structural issues which might arise in the data. And from there, they create this particular SAS, the files in the SAS format. Now, whatever functional or qualitative issues is there with the data, that is to be taken care of by the modeling team. All structural issues with the data in terms of data dirtiness, data cleanliness, and so on needs to be taken care of, are, are taken care of by the data management team, right? So it's also called some something called the enterprise data managers or something like that, so EDM team, EDM team, some, something like that, right? So what we have over here is, so they put it in the SaaS view. right so sas view so the data set that we generally get to see in the sas view are essentially modified data sets modified So what we have is as you we have the data management team we have the modified data sets so right so after having seen that after having seen this so so we have the modified uh, data sets. So basically, when whenever you are working with any kind of data, any kind of variables, whatever it is, we have the source files. And we have the modified data sets. right so whenever the requirement is right whenever you are working with a variable and say suppose you suspect there is some kind of an issue with the variable then this is where we need to do a source or this is the reason as to why we need to do a source target mapping so in the source to target mapping what we need to check is that the way the variables have been sourced from the source files, right, has been sourced from the source files. And the way they appear in the target files should be intuitively and characteristically similar. Right, so I'll have the source to target mapping over here. So over here, what I have is source files are the raw variables, and so this is the reason as to why a source to target mapping should be done. Now let's see. Let's take an example as to how and why this important thing is important. Now ideally, we suggest that as modelers, right, source to target mapping should be done. To be done for most important variables to be done
done. For most important variables. So for all the important variables that a product may have, what you need to do is you need to do the source, the appropriate source to target them. Okay. So this is to be done for the most important variables. However, if while working with any other variables, you get to see that there is some issue that you feel is there with the behavior of the variable that you expect it to have, then you should say that, uh, you know, we should see that uh, the more than the we should say that, okay, this as uh, these variables may have issue and for them, specifically, we do some kind of source to target methods. So over here, let's think about it like this. That uh, let's take a case of an overdraft data, right? So let's say there is a variable, an overdraft variable. Let me use another card. Overdraft. Overdraft. Now, there are broadly, uh, you know, so. There are two types of overdrafts that can happen depending on the products that the way the products are structured. Now, one type of uh, overdraft is an authorized overdraft. Is it authorized overdraft? So, where the borrower is authorized to draw money from uh, overdraw money up to a certain limit from his account. Now, uh, in Middle East, often, you know, the salary accounts that are opened, they are opened as current account with overdraft facilities and not with just, not just like simple savings account like the way we open, right? So in those cases, they have, there are certain accounts which have overdraft facilities, right? But there is also another type of a way where, you know, there is an unauthorized overdraft. So in an unauthorized overdraft, what happens is that I have a current account, but I'm not authorized to overdraw money. But what I do is I do overdraw money from the account. Now, if that unauthorized overdraft happens, then, then it means that any overdraft is over that is like it, it is subject to huge charges and uh, penalties and so on, things like that. Now, the question that comes out over here is that this authorized and unauthorized overdraft is a flag which is created by the data team, right? So what they do is they look into the logic, they look into the account, they put in their conditions and they create their their unauthorized or authorized overdraft OD, OD, you know, the flags, right? Now, how do you identify authorized overdrafts and unauthorized overdrafts? Now, this is to be observed in the source files. Now, in the source files, will not the source files will not record whether it's unauthorized or authorized overdraft. That would be created by the data management team. Now, whether it's authorized or unauthorized would be divided or would be explained using the following. Now, for an unauthorized overdraft, your balance can be greater than zero right balance is greater than zero that is you have overdrawn money or you have used that overdraft facility if you have used an overdraft facility the balance will be always be greater than zero but at the same time the limit to the overdraft should also be zero right on the other hand, with unauthorized overdrafts, the balance 
will be greater than zero. Obviously, greater than zero. Otherwise, the unauthorized overdraft does not, unauthorized part does not arise. So the limit is equal to zero. The limit is equal to zero. Or the limit is missing. Right. So borrowers who have you know balance greater than zero and, and are with limit equal to zero or limit missing will be your unauthorized over. So it means that these are the borrowers who do not have any limit or it was never approved to them. So it's zero or missing. And the balance is greater than zero. So those are the unauthorized overdrafts. Right. And the next part that I have over here is, is the authorized overdraft, which is balance greater than zero. The limit also greater than zero. So limit balance is greater than zero and limit equal to zero or limit is missing. So now having said that, having said that, uh, so now think about a, uh, an analyst who is looking into these, right? So now you need to actually divide your segment, your data into two parts, authorized overdrafts and unauthorized overdrafts, right? So basically borrowers who are unauthorized overdrafts, are likely to be more riskier than those borrowers who are authorized overdrafts. Let's say, for example, I'm taking in just arbitrary segment. So if you are doing this, then uh, then we suggest that a source to target mapping is actually done, right? So all the relative uh, the relevant accounts are extracted from the source files, right? Which contains the balance and the limits, right? And those are marked with authorized and unauthorized overdraft. And then what you do is for all those accounts, you check whether the flag that they have created, this team has created and the flag that you are getting from the source data are matching or not, right? And then you do a reconciliation exercise between the two, right? So that is a part of your source to target mapping, right? So what you do is you have, these have been done for a certain number of accounts you fetch those accounts from the source files, right? You apply the same logic that they have done. You reflag it, right, in the rod, uh, in, in, in the data set, right? And then you find out the flags that they have done. You merge it back to this, uh, uh, to this uh, data, right? And then you compare the flags. You do a freq of your flags and you check that how are the flags concentrated. Right. So if you see that is 100 percent reconciliation, you know that the flagging has been done appropriately because the problem over here is that that these the limit equal to zero is OK, but the limit equal to missing can arise because of multiple reasons. One is the limit was not given. It's coded like that. Also, if there is, there had been some errors in the codes with the which the data management team has done or they missed out some aspect, then the limit may not be properly fetched because this is a very important variable, the type of the overdraft facility that the borrowers have. It is always good to do a source to target mapping, right? So these are basic reconciliation exercises, which are a must, right, to be performed for number one, your balance variables, whatever your key balance variables are, right for revolving products whatever key balance variables the second is emi variables so emi is for uh, you know for all these uh, uh, fixed term products the third that we are that we look into is delinquency variables Fourth is 
limit variables for revolving products. Limit variables for the revolving products and so on. So these are the key variables. You know, the balance variables, the delinquency variables, the key categorical variables like the product types and also these all should be appropriately monitored. So the, the proper uh, social target mapping must be done in order to check, you know, whether all the date with key date variables are appropriately populated or not. Simple date variables, right? Six is key categorical variables. Categorical variables, so balance variables, EMIs, delinquency limits. So these are the key variables. Whenever whatever key variables you have, based on the product or the portfolio that you are working for, you need to do. You have suggested that you should do a source to target mapping. Right. So is this part clear to us? So any questions up to this part, the social target mapping? Okay. Great. Pradeep, anything from your side? Uh, I'm sure. Are you guys clear with this exercise? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, so we do social target mapping when we start developing the models, when we start working with the data. Right. So as we proceed forward as the data complications increase, we'll be working around those as well. So as of now, so let's just think about it like this. So, so once uh, your data set is, so basically what happens on the source files, uh, the modified data sets are created by the data management team and it is archived. So, so that the, these data sets are also archived. Now archiving the data sets over a period of time can lead to multiple problems, right? So. This archiving problem is something with which we had started to discussing about in the last class. So one is, you know, uh, there can be uh, problems like the files can get unzipped. I mean, the files uh, may get zipped, right? So zipped files, SAS cannot be really zipped files. So those files need to be unzipped before they are being read, right? Now, while archiving is done, Another problem of archiving is that <clears throat> so another problem of archiving is that that the data set may be scattered scattered across multiple locations. So I may save data set. Say I need data from 2014 to 2018 on monthly basis. Okay. Say I need data from 2014-01. to 201 2017-12 right I need monthly data now what happens is I see that data set from 2014 01 01 to 2016, 2015, 
0.6 is stored at one place, right? And within this, within this part, some of the data sets from 2016 is zipped into one folder in order to save upon server space, right? So when you are actually extracting the data sets to your own library, that extracting these these data sets uh, from the production data sets, when you extract the production data sets to your own library, your own location, what you need to have is you need to look into okay where, whether this is zip or, or maybe unzip. Where are these? So you have to pull in everything called to your own location, and from your own location you need to work with it. So. So basically over here, uh, when, while data extraction is being done, there are certain extraction protocols which we need to talk about. Now, one very important protocol is that whatever codes that you are writing while data extraction or during model development exercises, everything has to be logged. So you must create a backup log. So the logs that are generated in SAS while the code runs, that needs to be taken care of right so so extraction protocols so one of the extraction protocols is Okay, so extraction protocols. Now, when we talk about extraction protocols, uh, what are the things that we have over here? First is all codes or all, all outputs to be logged, right? And the logs should be error and warning free. So this is a very important protocol that outputs to be Log. So when you are writing your code, you need to ensure that you have sufficient provision in your code which would ensure, which would help you to kind of, you know, which will help you in logging the output, uh, logging the codes at the back end. So outputs to be logged. Log. And the logs should be error free and warning free right the next part that we have over here is so once the outputs are to be logged the next uh, the second thing that we need to know is that production data sets must be accessed with a read only access so production data sets to be accessed with read only To be accessed with read only with read only. With read only, right? So production data to be accessed with or read only access. Clear? So over here, uh, so these are some of the basic protocols, right? So which we need to keep in mind while we are writing our codes, because otherwise, uh, you know, these are some important things which which does not really affect your model as such, but these are something which can lead to breach of controls as well. So you access your production data set with some without a with read and write access. And what happens if your production data set gets altered? Then that's a breach of control. Right. So these are something that needs to be taken care of. Okay. So in this regard, Mohan has a question over here. I'll just take that part up. 
So, uh, yeah. So, Mrinma asks me, by, by output, you mean extracting the data sets from the server? No. The output means uh, not only the data extraction. Say, I'm extracting the data, right? So, it follows step one, step two, step three, step four. And in each step, some data set is being created or something is being generated. So, those outputs to be logged, right? So that you know that, okay, this happened at this stage, this happened at this stage, and at each stage, there was no error. So that's what needs to be done. Right? So also the runtime of the code to be logged. So you need to, uh, when you are starting the code, you need to control your code saying that you tap the starting time of the code and you tap the end time of the code. So so that the overall time of uh, running, the, the I mean, you know, the overall time that has been taken by the code to execute is also logged at your end. So this is another important part. So these are some of the important protocols which we need to look while uh, data extraction is being done not only data extraction but at each stage of the model development exercise these are factors which needs to be looked into clear Right. So this is the initial part. Now the next part that uh, comes in is when I talk. So these are the you know the, the the structural or these are the functional aspects that are involved into data extraction, data quality check exercises. The next thing that we need to talk about is what are the type of variables that needs to be extracted. So what. type of variables need to be extracted. What type of variables need to be extracted? Right. So what are the type of variable that needs to be extracted? Now when we talk about the type of variables that need to be extracted, we need to talk about two things. One is at what stage that you are, are you extracting? So that is the application stage. The application stage or the acquisition stage. The next part is the behavior. 
So depending on what type or at what stage or what type of what is the purpose for which the data extraction is being done, we will get to see the results of these extractions, right? So we get to see what type of variables should be extracted, right? So let's start off with the application data. So I, I'm going to develop an acquisition scorecard. What are the type of variables that need to be extracted, right? Okay. Okay. So, uh, so I am just doing this board work. You know, I, I do a free kind of a board work, right? So I, I'll share over this board work with you guys today, so that you can have a look into it and prepare yourself. So the last recordings up to the last week has been shared out. So I'll share out the recordings for this week as well. Okay. Fine. So let's have a look into the next part. So that is, say, acquisition scorecards. So I need to develop an acquisition scorecard. So what is my business problem here? So I want to know whether I should be accepting a loan application or I should be declining a loan application. The acquisition scorecard. Now, when I say it's acquisition scorecard, so what what is the business problem that I'm trying to address over here? It's the accept decline decision that the bank is trying to take. So basically, y equals to one. If the borrower is gold. equal to zero otherwise equal to zero otherwise equal to zero otherwise okay so over here what we have is so this is what the acquisition scorecard is now the question that comes out is that what are the type of risk that we are trying to assess over here what are the factors that we are trying to evaluate one is the application spoke one is one is the affordability associated with the one
of the borrower. So it's the affordability of the borrower. And the next part is the reliability of the borrower. So I'm trying to assess these two things. So now the question that comes out over here is that how do I assess the affordability of the borrower? Now, if I'm trying to assess the affordability of the borrower, what am I trying to actually do? Let's say. So affordability of the borrower is assessed from his income sources. His income, his current financial status, financial status. Right, except right. So the next part that we have over here is the reliability. Now, how do you assess the reliability of the borrower? The reliability of the borrower is assessed from his past records from his past history. From his past history. Right? So the next part is so past history. So the next part uh, that we have is from his demographic details. From his demographic history. From his demographic history. History exception, right? So now let's imagine that what are the fields or what are the parts from where this information can come in, right? So number one, coming to the income. The income of a borrower would come in from his KYC, right? So when the borrower fills the KYC for his current uh, product or his current requisition of product, you will get the income. Similarly, the current financial status that we have over here is. So when you talk about the current financial status, this current financial status comes from the bank's records. So if the borrower is a relationship borrower, then this bank will have the borrower's financial status. That's the bank's records. Right. So the past history will again come from. So this comes from the bank's records. Bank's records. As well as. The bureaus. The bureau records.
right? And the demographic history becomes clear from the KYC. The demographic history becomes uh, relevant from the KYC. So these are some of the important factors that we have, right? So now when the acquisition scorecard is being created or whenever the variables are being extracted, we need to extract all these relevant information from multiple sources, right? So one of the uh, one of the parts that we will have we'll talk over here is so first let's talk about the bureau source or internal records internal records or internal uh, records so within the internal records what are the type of files what are the type of uh, variables that will be extracted? Now, the first set of records that I have over here is the following. So for internal records, uh, the first set of variables that I have is Banks customer history. So this will give us an idea about the behavior that the borrower has with other products of the bank, the bank's customer history. The bank's customer history. So over here, within this, what are the type of information that comes in? The type of assets that the bank holds, say current account. So whether the borrower holds a current account or not. Yes or no? Current account. Then the next part is savings account. So whether the borrower holds a savings account or not. Okay. No, uh, sorry, that screen didn't uh, freeze. I just lost, you know, somehow my mouse was not connecting. Okay, savings account. Then the other demand deposits. Other kind of demand deposits that the particular bank can have with the borrower can have with the bank. So this is the next kind of demand deposit that is there. Now the question that comes out is that what are these uh, used for? Why why would this be a, a important variable? Why would current account be an important variable? Why would savings account be an important variable? And why 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 would I need to look into these?
So, okay. So, over here, what I have is the current account and the savings account. Now, this current account is a variable which shows the current account is a variable, you know, which shows uh, the typical uh, lending tendencies of a borrower. Because if you have a current account with an overdraft facility, right, so it gives you an idea about the lending patterns or the lending tendency of the borrower that uh, whether the borrower or, or how frequently has the borrower been delinquent on the uh, what should I say on the current account right so how many times has he taken back the taken the fund but not returned it back also on the other hand how much how many times has he been able to uh, you know how many times has he been or does he regularly pay back the money or he defers has he been delinquent is his current account balance overdrawn for a long period of time and so on so these are some of the information that gives us a very clear idea about the lending traits of a borrower so whenever we are developing either acquisition models or behavioral models right or for the retail portfolio the current account and the overdraft statuses are of very lending uh, are very critical variables you know for model developments because they give you an idea about the clear idea about the lending traits of this particular borrower right now savings account and demand deposits right these two accounts are so savings account and demand deposit accounts are uh, given. Uh, so basically savings account and demand deposit accounts are uh, kind of, so these are accounts which give you an idea about the affordability of the borrower, right? So they give you an idea about how affordable is the borrower. So if I have a huge savings account with me, savings account balance with me, or I have other demand deposits like, you know, uh, fixed deposits with the bank. The bank knows that, that, okay, this is a guy who is actually very useful for, uh, so who has sufficient amount of funds with him. And in case, even if he loses his job, he can actually pay back that money to me. Affordability. So these are very important affordability traits. Now, mostly these are, if you have a look into this, these are all the bank's customer history. So, so this is the history that is available with the bank itself, right? So this is where, you know, this borrowers, the current account, savings account, demand deposit. So these are extracted from the bank's customer history, right? So let's say, let me call it, account details so this is one file from which account acc underscore date underscore uh something like this say y y y y amen so this is say a monthly file which contains the monthly current account statuses, savings account balance and demand deposit. So from there, right, we can, as on a day, we can actually pull in how much of savings account balance, how much of demand deposit, how much current account balance that the borrower would actually be having. So this is basically internal records. This is the bank's customer history. And say basically these are account details. So details of the different products that the bank has with them. So this is what we are essentially looking into, right? So any questions up to this point? Great. Okay. 
Okay, so as I go ahead, right? So if you guys have any questions, if you have any queries, feel free to button. Okay. So if you have if you have any other observations which can make the uh, you know the, which can enrich the explanation, feel free to reach out. Just just to feel free to button and uh, join into the conversation. Okay. So this is one set of files, one set of records which the bank uh, generally has with them, right? So I'll. I, I, I would be actually extracting these in order to have an idea about his historical lending traits or his affordability uh, traits from these information. So these are information which is available with the bank. Now, these borrowers who have sufficient amount of savings account or demand deposit maintained with the bank is also known as or borrowers who have a you know, relationship history with the bank is known as a relationship borrower. The relationship borrower. Guys, just hold on. Okay, so these are known as the relationship borrowers. So borrowers who have had a certain kind of demand deposit maintained with the bank is known as a relationship borrower. Right? Now, these informations would be ideally available for relationship borrowers. For non-relationship borrowers, these are something that would not be available. Now, apart from this, there are other variables, there are other factors which are there, you know, which would actually help us yeah. in identifying the yeah. affordability, the reliability of the yeah. model. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. Okay. So apart from this, there are other factors, you know, so such as the bank's customer history. So apart from the bank's customer history, there are other factors involved into it as well. So what are the factors that are there? Uh, the next set of factors are customer, the customer information. So over here, see the next set of files that we can have is customer info. Info. So I'll write it as Y Y M N. So this is precisely your customer information file, and within this information, you will get your variables or information on variables related to the customers. Uh, demographic information that is his address, where does he put up, what is the location that he is based out of. So, his demographic information is something that we will get. 
also you associated with it you will get your employment details get your employment details right and the next thing that you will get over here also that you get over here is other KYC information like uh, his uh, property ownership etc property ownership and so on right so these are some of the critical information that we generally get at our end right so from this particular asset or from this particular uh, from these files now these are essentially the reliability information or the reliability or the affordable reliability information associated with the bank so this is typical reliability traits of the borrower so how reliable is a particular borrower of lending the product so what is so over here what we have is reliability traits Now let's say, for example, if I talk about employment. Now there are multiple types of employment variables which come into play. One is the employment type. employment type the type of environment that the borrower is in so if, if, is it is he a permanent employee is he a consultant is he a uh, unskilled laborer skilled laborer so what what is the type of his employment right the next is the employment vintage So the next part that we have over here is the employment vintage. Employment vintage, right. Now when I talk about the employment vintage, what happens is, so the number of years the borrower has been working with it. Now these two give you, uh, now given your employment type and your employment vintage, Given your employment type and employment vintage, right? So the next thing that we have over here is so these in turn not only they talk of the reliability traits of the borrower, right? So given the employment type and the employment vintage, you can also make out an idea about the affordability of the borrower. So these two together goes into decide or help us decide the affordability slash the reliability of the borrower because you know that 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 the employment type is a consultant and he's been a consultant for the last 15 years so you do have a clear idea about you do have a rough idea about how much this guy could possibly earn and what is the amount of credit that you given however a more direct kind of information for this real affordability comes from his salary day right so you have your affordability and you have your reliability matrices now having come down from this particular part the next thing that we need to work on is we need to understand how much of an employment or the next important thing is the employer's title Now the employer title is another thing which is a really important variable that we have over here. Mm. 
employer title, right? So now what banks generally do is banks maintain a, a list of their trusted employers. So for example, uh, I'm someone who is employed by the Wolf of Wall Street, right? And the market crashes and he goes for a toss. So does my job. So therefore, the bank decides upon a high-risk employer, mid-risk employer, and low-risk employers. So based on the employer title, the bank has its own list of trusted employers. Right? So the more trusted the employer of the customer is, the more... Uh, the better the borrower is considered to be and hence lower is the risk associated with it right so this is precisely what we mean by trusted employers so this is known as a trusted employer list or some uh, organizations also called the approved list of employers or uh, so, so similar things but the basic idea remains that this list is the list of the trusted employers so these are some of the variables which will give us an idea about the employers vintage uh, you know about the reliability of the borrower now both of these files that we've been talking about over here are kind of the internal files that we have over here right now the third set of files that we have over here is the external files or the bureau files so these give an idea, this give us an idea about how the bureau information can be extracted in order to deliver, you know, in order to form, frame an idea about the reliability of the borrower. And that is the next part of our discussion. Okay. So let's take a pause here for the day, right? I, because the bureau information would be a very detailed section. So we'll stop uh, with this part and uh, we'll continue it uh, from the next session thank you guys uh, thank you for your time and let's meet for the next discussion to have a further clarity on these portions thank you bye bye okay have a thank great you day. thanks then bye